Hi, I'm Lisa. I'm Nick, and welcome to Under the Covers with Lisa and Nick. So our guest today is author of New York Times bestselling book, Lifespan, Why We Age and Why We Don't Have To. He is referred to as a superstar of the science world. He's the co-director of the Paul F. Glenn Center for the Biology of Aging at Harvard Medical School. Now, I like to start our interviews with some interesting facts, and I don't know if these are myths or not, um, about our guests. So these ones are that he eats one meal a day, predominantly stressed out plants. We definitely need to talk about that later. <laughs> and I actually was listening to a Joe Rogan episode where he says he exercises once a week for three hours he also sleeps with no blankets. I don't know how he does that because I definitely need to be wrapped up in at least 10 dooners. Uh, he's the world's leading longevity expert and fellow Australian. Welcome to the show, David Sinclair. Lisa, Nick, thanks for having me on. David, mate, as I mentioned earlier, thank you for existing. Um, <laughs> I've got friends and myself who have been looking for someone like yourself for many, many years. And as I mentioned earlier, I came across your book, Lifespan, and absolute game changer. So you're, you must be one of the most wanted men in the world. People want to know what you have. How do you find time to run all these businesses and do what you do? Uh, well, it's a bit nuts. <clears throat> I'm trying to cut back, uh, spend more time with family, uh, especially during this time. Uh, but I, I don't do anything for myself, really. I don't uh, go on vacations with friends. I don't go out that much. That's uh, That's my sacrifice. But I love what I do so much. And I'm in a position where I can, I think I can help the world. So it's all, it's all good. But uh, these days I'm cooking more dinners for, for the kids and that kind That's of great. thing. I'm trying to slow down a little bit. What does a typical day look like for you? Well, uh, you know, in nine, uh, 2019, a typical day would have been uh, start in bed reading uh, news and emails and scientific papers, uh, get out, go, go into the lab. Uh, I've got about 20 students and postdoctoral researchers that are doing amazing things, see how they're doing, look at their data, head downtown to maybe a couple of the companies that I work with. Um, and, you know, sometimes fly around the world uh, giving talks, but also trying to uh, raise awareness about what I do, because a lot of people haven't ever heard that aging itself should be considered a disease. David, my, my mom tells me I should age gracefully and just let nature take its course. I say, stuff that. What can I use, what, can, what science can I use to, to beat nature or at least increase my uh, longevity? Now, I'm a massive fan of using supplements and I'm trying to convince Lisa to jump on uh, metformin and some other supplements. Mate, just keen to hear your thoughts around this because should we age gracefully or just go, no, no, stuff that and just go, what can we do to increase our longevity? Well, well gracefully uh, rarely happens, unfortunately. You know, that old age is, if we're honest, it's filled with pain and misery. It's, uh, yeah. if you're lucky enough to avo avoid cancer and heart disease, you know, you'll get dementia. There's nothing graceful. Well, there are, you know, there are some lucky few that have good genes and, and good luck uh, and, and look after themselves. But you know, we've all had family members that, despite what they did, it, the end wasn't pretty and it was fairly drawn out. Um, I can speak for my mother's, on my mother's uh, behalf, she spent 20 years suffering. So this is, you know, saying, oh, let's just let nature take, take its course, uh, I think is, is craziness to say that. You know, we, we don't say that about cancer and heart disease, though we used to, right, before we had any tools or medicines. But now as we understand aging more and more and we have some ways to slow it, slow it down and even potentially reverse this process, you know, why wouldn't we use that technology to make people healthier for longer and age even more gracefully? Well, that, that leads me to my next question. What, what type of technology can we utilize ourselves to increase our longevity? Apart from using, say, supplements, maybe, maybe it is just supplements, but are there things we can do to increase? Uh, well, so as, as I wrote, as I wrote in my book, often people ask me, what's one thing you can recommend people do? And so if there is one thing I'm allowed to say, it's, it's eat less. Uh, well, actually eat, eat less often is more to the point. There are some excellent studies, uh, both in animals, mostly mice, uh, rats, um, and humans who 
don't eat the three square meals a day and snacks in between that we've been raised on, those of us mostly in develop, the developed world, particularly Western countries. You know, we're, we're told, oh, get up in the morning and eat a big breakfast for the day. And then, and then we're into lunch and having a, perhaps a, a business lunch and then dinner is a big meal. It, that's really bad. And so we're struggling. Some of us go to the gym, others don't have time or don't have the will. And this has led to the world that we live in where you know, soon half of the world's population will be overweight or obese. Now on the flip side, what you can do is, what I think is healthier, a lot healthier based on the science is, uh, don't eat three meals a day uh, and try not to snack in between. Now I'm not talking about kids, I'm not talking about malnutrition or starvation, you know, that's the last thing we want. But for people who are you know, over 30, especially for people who are middle-aged and older, three meals is a lot of food. <laughs> Nick. <laughs> yeah, it is a lot of food. And if we struggle to keep the weight down and you get used to not eating three meals a day. I, these days I'm, I'm a little bit uh, more generous uh, with myself. I, I eat probably two meals a day. Um, but what I used to do before I spent my time at home uh, was uh, I was so busy, I didn't even notice that I wasn't eating. So I would skip breakfast. Uh, I would skip lunch uh, and have a really nice dinner, and that was good. Uh, these days, you know, if you're if you're at home and you're next to a fridge, uh, it's it's a little harder. I'm only human; I'm not not perfect, uh, but I, I do find that for me, no breakfast works, and for some people, no dinner works. But try to skip one meal if you can. Mm. So, so, are you saying that bodybuilders will actually have a shorter life as a result because they have to eat six or seven meals a day, potentially? Well, you know, I don't want to make anyone panic, but I would say as a scientist, uh, I haven't seen any evidence that bodybuilders live longer or are protected against diseases of aging. It's typical, the, the smaller, literally smaller and leaner human beings that, that live a long time. It just if you go to a, a nursing home, okay, uh, it's mostly women, smaller, skinny women, right? You don't see big, muscly tall men it's Good it's point. just a fact that's yeah i'm not really saying anything that isn't factual uh but you know would i, would I worry about weightlifting absolutely not i i do weightlifting myself and it's very important to maintain muscle mass as we get older in part because if you fall over and break a bone over the age of 80 you you, you may not ever recover and this happened to my grandmother so maintain flexibility and strength is really important for surviving maybe not in the way you you might think uh but accidents are real killers. Yeah. So what exercise do you do? Because I was listening to that Joe Rogan podcast where you said you exercise once a week for three hours, but then you take other supplements where your body, I guess, feels like it is working out. Um, I would love to do that. In fact, I would love to not have to exercise at all if possible, <laughs> but still be thin. Right. Yeah, yeah. I'm with you. I, I don't enjoy being exhausted or out of breath, though. The science says that if you lose your breath for 15 minutes every day or every other day, it's really helpful for your long-term health. Uh, you know, I, I used to work out once for three hours a week. Now I do three times one hour every week. Uh, it's a good time spent with uh, our son, Benjamin. But yeah, you've got to, you've got to move. Um, you've got to be out of breath a little bit because what you're doing is you're, you're telling your body that times could be tough. Uh, you know, we used to be chased by saber-toothed tigers or wolves. Uh, we used to be hungry a lot. And we adapted to that. And in fact, our bodies learned to protect themselves against, well, adversity. And it turns out if you do this a lot, protect against diseases of aging. Um, and, you know, just sitting around all, all day, you know, watching TV or reading a book and not going for a walk and eating three meals a day is a signal to your body, hey, times are great. I have no reason to protect myself against any adversity that might come. And our inbuilt defenses against aging and disease just switch off. David, thanks to you on social media, Meta Metformin has exploded online. <laughs> uh, like it's, it's actually exploded and people now tagging me in post because they, they saw me talking about it because of you, obviously. Now I've been taking Meta Metformin, sorry, not Meta Metformin for about a year. I haven't noticed a difference. Do you notice any results? Or is it just, you just take it and hope for the best and do blood work? Mm. Well, I do blood work and it, it's helped me. I was heading towards having reasonably high blood sugar, which is a, a path to, to shorter life for sure. 
Um, and in fact, probably the biggest indicator of long life is having stable and, and lowish blood sugar for your age. Uh, so that's what metformin will do. It's not going to likely make you feel suddenly younger and run a marathon. If anything, it might actually slightly reduce your ability to run further mm -hmm. distances uh, and work out. That's one of the potential downsides in some small studies in people. But in a couple of notable studies that looked at over 10,000 people who were given metformin for type 2 diabetes, which is high blood sugar, of course, uh, they generally, on average, did a lot better in old age. And so you might expect they have less type 2 diabetes than someone that didn't take the drug, which is true. But they also were relatively protected against cancer, heart disease, wow. Alzheimer's, and frailty. So based on those, you know, epidemiological studies, I think there's a pretty good case to be made that if you take metformin, it will certainly keep your glucose under control and might protect you against cancer and heart disease and other things like that. Now, it's always a risk if you take a drug. Metformin is actually a prescribed drug in many countries, not all. You can, if you want to go to Thailand, you can just buy it at a chemist because it's, it's, it's considered one of the safest drugs out there. But there's still risks. You can have some side effects. One's called lactic acidosis. Uh, your stomach can have uh, a lot of, uh, I don't know if you, Nick, you noticed, but it can be tough on the stomach if it's not a slow release pill. Yeah, I have noticed. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I've actually only taken it, say, um, one, or, uh, one or two days a week because of, I heard it impacts weight training and exercising. So I take it on my off days, as you mentioned. <laughs> That, that's right. Yeah, if, if I take it, it's 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 with a meal to protect my stomach, um, preferably slow release and yeah, not days that I'm exercising. Uh, but yeah, that, that's one of the medicines that stands out in the field. This isn't just my research. There's a lot of other scientists who say the same. But there's a there are, there's a growing number of molecules that are either sold as drugs, available as supplements, or in development for both um, that allow us that now live in the 21st century to make calculated risks as to what we're going to do about that. You know, Nick, you've, you've weigh, obviously weighed up. Is it worth a very tiny risk to you for your health going south versus the long-term benefits? Um, and I can tell you, I think I'm way older than either of you. The older you get, the more risks you're willing to take. Mm. Mm. Sorry, Liz, just one more question. So that leads into my next question. A lot of men over 50 are now taking synthetic human growth hormone. Does that have any benefit to longevity or is it actually just a myth? Because it's quite common. Yeah. Well, that there isn't any evidence that it'll extend um, lifespan, but I don't believe it's been studied in such detail. Okay. What's generally agreed upon by scientists is uh, that it will build muscle strength, um, and you will feel as though you have more energy. These are, these are benefits, of course. Uh, there are a number of scientists, maybe not the majority, but there's a, there's a handful of, of them that would say, a minority that would say there's a risk. If you take growth hormone, it may stimulate a tumor if you have one in your body. Uh, but I, I haven't seen any proof of that just yet. Uh, so I think that the jury's still out. So again, it's this calculation, do I want energy, um, greater muscle strength, um, greater, I guess, uh, vitality with some risk as well. Yeah, it's actually interesting because like, honestly, I have not seen a medicine cabinet as um, stock full as Nick's. He has so many <laughs> vitamins every day and he's always like, you got to try this, try this. It's like, you know, look at me. I look so much younger. I'm like, you don't. You no, still I'm just hanging on to my, I'm trying to hang on to my youth. <laughs> Like he did a lot of damage in his younger younger days clubbing. Uh, <laughs> so he's trying to reverse this, the signs of aging. But I think I'm at the age where like, I'm not wanting to take those risks yet. So it's really interesting that you say as you get older, you're like, okay, I'll try more things. But what vitamins or what's your daily supplement routine? Because uh, Nick was telling me that he has about 20 supplements a day. So I imagine that yours might be must be quite interesting. Uh, well, it, it's not that crazy. I, I, if anyone really wants to know, I listed it in my book, page 304. So that's the cheat <laughs> point. But please, you know, re read the pages before that, because that'll tell you why I made those decisions and why my father did too. Uh, I, I don't take a lot. I, I think vitamin D 
Um, I put vitamin C in because of the pandemic. Uh, alpha lipoic acid, um, I, a good friend of mine who passed away made it to his mid, 19, uh, mid 90s. And wow. uh, so that didn't seem to do him any harm. Alpha lipoic acid will help with uh, mitochondrial reactions. Uh, what else do I do? So I'm, I'm taking the drug, um, well, a drug, a statin drug. I won't name it, but uh, I have high cholesterol from my family and I bring that down. And so to compensate, one of the side effects is you, um, you lose CoQ10. So I'm supplementing with that every day as well. The one that we work on in my lab in part is, or some of my lab works on is called NMN. And sometimes people confuse those with M&Ms. And so I don't say take M&Ms. It's NMN and it stands for nicotinamide mononucleotide, which is just a long way of saying it's a precursor to a molecule that our bodies need for health. And we think uh, healthy old age. And so the molecule that it makes or the body uses it to make is called NAD. And so just briefly, NAD is in our bodies. We have lots of it. It's one of the most abundant molecules. And as we get older, we make less of it. And without NAD, first of all, you can have less metabolism, slow metabolism, but also some of the body's survival pathways that we work on called sirtuins. There are seven of those enzymes that protect the body. They need NAD or they won't work. And having less NAD makes they work, means they work slower. So the idea is take in a man, raise your NAD levels back up to what they were when you were young. And when we do that in mice, at least, we see that the mice run further, protected against, um, uh, what was it, breast cancer. There's a variety of things. Other labs have shown protection against other diseases, uh, kidney disease. So we don't know in humans really at all if it will extend lifespan, make us healthier. But what I know is it, it's basically, a, it's a vitamin related to niacin or vitamin B3. And the risk is very low. I've also been involved, well, at least I'm, I'm helping a company that's doing clinical trials with NMN or a molecule just like it. And for the last two years, there's been no safety questions about it. So with all that, again, NMN, low risk, maybe some payoff. I certainly feel better, might be placebo, but <laughs> if there's mice or anything to go by, it might be helping with my blood flow and, and my muscle strength. I'm going to pretend that I heard M&Ms and I'm going to go out and buy them. <laughs> Nick's probably going to stock up on NMMs. Well, if you feel great, what's your what's your biological age? Well, I haven't measured it recently. It's probably not that great. Uh, but a few years ago, I measured it using uh, just an assay that is it's not super accurate, but it's it's measuring things like glucose levels, testosterone, inflammation, and um, so it came back at thirty one point four. Wow. Uh, at the time I was in my late forties. So that was, right. it was promising uh, <laughs> though with all, with all the stress and having three kids at home and yeah, you know, it's, it's a stressful time that we live in right now. Uh, I'm not sure I'm doing that well, uh, but I'm doing my best. I think we all should. That's the point. You don't have to go crazy. You don't have to be hungry. Um, but, you know, try something, mm. you know, even a little bit will certainly make you feel better. And if you don't want to run, by the way, uh, Lisa, just walking these days is. is Lisa, just enough. walk. Just walk. I do. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure yeah. you do. I've got a I've got a dog, so I um, usually take her for a walk, which is good. That's actually one of the best things about you know listening to your interviews and reading your interviews and and uh, reading your book. You make because obviously what you do is highly complicated. Like I'm not even going to pretend like I don't even know where to start with thinking about all of the stuff that you must do in the lab, but you make it very accessible. I think that's one of your real, uh, I guess, strengths because, you know, someone like myself and Nick, like I'm going to speak on behalf of Nick, we're obviously not the most intellectual people, but you really, you know, I guess make it sound exciting and interesting, but in a way that the average person can really consume. And I also love that you're not 
saying everything that you're doing, stop it. It's really bad. Don't ever drink alcohol again. Don't eat chocolate. Like you, you know, you say that you are human. And so, you know, I think sometimes when people talk about doing a particular diet or, you know, living your life like this, you can feel kind of guilty when you're listening to them talk about it. So you're like, oh my God, I do all these things wrong. But you're like, no, I have like a drink. Like, you know, I'll go out on hol- I'll go on holiday and I'll have like 10 drinks. So I think like good on you for doing that because it is, you know, I think what you're doing is obviously very amazing but you still enjoy life which i think is still part of you know living of course (laughs) yeah there's nothing worse that there's an adage in our field uh we scientists have terrible jokes we say uh, calorie restricting or intermittent fasting it may not make you live longer but it'll certainly make life feel longer (laughs) yeah that is you don't want it to be like that you want to enjoy life um and if it's getting too hard uh, you know you can back off but I appreciate you saying that. And it's in my experience. I know a fair number of uh, health gurus and a fair number of them, I won't say any names, but you know, they're saying, do this, do that. And you know, you can see that they're breaking their own rules. And I think that's just hypocritical. So I'm, I, 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 I try to practice what I preach uh, and do my best and, and really go where the science goes. You know, That's one of the things that I really tried to do in the book is to say, not just what you should do, but why. And here's the explanation in a way that you can understand so that when you're at the fridge or you're at the restaurant, you can actually think, oh, I'm activating this longevity mechanism Mm -hmm. in my body. And I think it really helps if you understand why what you're doing is actually helping or might be helping. Can you actually talk about the stressed out plants? Because I thought that was really interesting (laughs) and really random, to be honest. Uh, Yeah, it... It's a theory that I came up with um, with a colleague, Conrad Howitz. And you and maybe some listeners and viewers may recall uh, the story about red wine that came out of our lab, what is about 15 years ago, that red wine has a molecule called resveratrol that activates sirtuins. Aha, Nick, got it. So resveratrol is made by plants that are stressed out. Uh, And grapes, before you harvest them to make red wine, they make a lot of resveratrol. Um, Other plants do too, but we happen to bottle resveratrol up, uh, keep it away from the light and oxygen, which is good. And so it preserves the molecule and we can drink it. And it also happens to to taste good. And maybe one of the reasons why red wine is good for you. But what it led to was the idea that there are a number of plant molecules that work like resveratrol. Uh, There's one called physetin, uh, quercetin, or quercetin, some people call it. These are a, a class of molecules, like you could draw them, but they basically look a little bit, a little bit like chicken wire or a barbell. Uh, they all look quite similar and they all activate this enzyme CERT1 that we work on that helps the body. And we were trying to understand, oh, another one, a new one I wanna mention is oleic acid that you can get from olive oil. So th- it's interesting that a lot of the foods that we scientists have figured out are good for us have a, an explanation. And that is that the plant molecules Uh, that are made by stressed plants, either they're thirsty or they're hungry plants, uh, we want to get the the message into our body that our food supply might be running out. Mm -hmm. Remember, we we weren't always conscious beings. We couldn't go, oh, that plant that I'm harvesting is dying. You know, usually we were just running around like little, uh, little mice or before that jellyfish that needed to get the information chemically rather than visually. And that's that's what I think is going on when we eat these stress plants. Often they have a lot of color in them. So colored foods are good. The molecules go in, our enzymes, the sirtuins sense those chemicals. And if there's lots of them, then they go to action and protect our bodies so that we can survive the oncoming famine that might, might uh, be just around the corner. Yeah, that's really interesting. So you, so you avoid the big steaks and just have the distressed plants instead? <laughs> uh, well, I, don't eat a lot of meat. I tend to, uh, you know, eat mostly a, a plant-based diet if I can. But yeah, you know, I would say if you're a carnivore, you know, that's great. I have nothing against that. But I haven't seen a lot of evidence that a lot of meat consumption will make you live longer and be healthier. Because, you know, let, let's be honest. If you look at the longest lived populations on the planet, and Dan Butner wrote a good book on this, uh, The Blue Zones, these are groups of people that tend to eat a lot of 
fresh vegetables, majority vegetables, maybe a bit of fish, not so much red meat. They drink red wine or have olive oil and, and they go hungry for part of the time, either through, for religious reasons or economic. And they exercise, they keep moving, they're gardening in their 90s. So, you know, it doesn't take a genius to figure out what's likely to make us live longer. Yeah. One more question for you, because I could keep talking for hours with you. Um, are, we, are we at a stage now we can predict our time of death or when we're going to die? Huh. We, we, we kind of are at that point. Um, Ten years ago, we didn't know how to do it. We'd, we'd look at gray hair, or, you know, glucose levels. By the way, gray hair never killed anybody. I, that, that was, I misspoke. <laughs> But basically, we were just observing how people were doing and how fast they walked. Turns out the best predictor right now is how fast you walk. Is, um, really? Wow. Yeah, yeah. You want to keep keep moving. Uh, I don't know if it's cause or effect, but definitely if you're starting to slow down, that's a bad sign. Uh, <laughs> makes sense, right? You might have arthritis. You might have lack of energy. But that that's, um, that's another way. The other way you can tell before I get into the rest of it is, uh, can you stand up without touching the floor? Uh, and that's a, that's a pretty good test of your overall health. You see, so you're on the floor and you, you basically push that without using your hands to touch right. the floor. Ah. Right. So a, a really young person can just cross their legs and stand up. I yeah. use my hands all the time. A middle aged person needs one hand to get up and an older person has to get on their knee. Wow, that's like Nick. He's really... Ah, oh, geez, oh, it's all over. <laughs> Just give up now. Um, well, we have time for one more question. And this is, um, look, it's not the most scientific question, but I have to say, like, I'm a skincare fanatic. So I wear probably about eight moisturizers a day. I don't even know really what I'm putting on my face. I'm just trying to look as young as possible, especially with all these video conferences where you see your skin, you're like, oh my God, I'm starting to look really old. Please tell me what your skincare routine is because you look very young. <laughs> you look younger than Nick and I. <laughs> no, that's also not true. Uh, but I did get roasted in the Australian sun. Uh, so I'm, I'm happy that I'm not totally wrinkled yet. Uh, so if anyone's looking at, at me right now, you can judge, you might want to know how old I am. I'm 51. 51. But, um, We're good. Well, thanks. But, uh, <laughs> good lighting though. Is it the Zoom filter? <laughs> <laughs> it might be. So what do I, what do, I do? Well, I, I take these molecules that hopefully slow aging in my skin just as much as my liver and my heart. That's mainly it. Uh, I, I do put a moisturizer on that we developed for a cosmetic company. Mm. That, uh, boosts NAD, we hope, and uh, that might be part of it. I don't know. Um, I haven't got any gray hair, which is surprising. Um, <laughs> you know, gray hair, that's, that's very surprising at 51. Well done. Yeah. Um, so there's that. Oh, I, Lisa, I also wanted to to mention that we can accurately measure the clock in the body. We can do a blood test or a skin test. Sometimes it's called the Horvath clock or the DNA methylation what? clock. What are you talking That's about? That's very accurate. Uh, it's within 5% and you can actually predict uh, when somebody's gonna die. And <laughs> the good news is that you can alter the trajectory uh -huh. of the clock by doing these things. Uh, and we're finally learning actually, at least in animals, that, that you cannot just slow the trajectory, you can send it backwards. Uh, and in fact, just tonight, I'm going to attend the first conference on reprogramming the body to be young again. That's insane. So have you done it on yourself? Yes, that was my next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, oh. like, oh, it's, it's a viral delivery of gene therapy and it could go horribly wrong, but we've given it to mice for over a year. We've injected the gene therapy into the eye of old mice and they've been able, they were blind and then able to see like they're young again. Wow. So it's, it's pretty cool technology. And if it works in the rest of the body, like it works in the eye, uh, we, we have something really interesting uh, in our hands now. The, the conference is a number of world leaders gathering because we think that this could be a turning point in the field of aging. That's insane. And well done to you. Like you're obviously one of the pioneers of it. And I was actually listening to, I think you talking about that clock and you were injecting or you, you did it in a two-year-old um, mouse and then it was taken back to being three months old. I think the muscle, the muscle. The muscle, yeah. The yeah. muscle was with NMN. 
Um, the difference with this new technology is it seems to be a permanent reset. It actually doesn't just make the body feel younger, but in the mouse's case, it's literally younger, that the clock goes back and the cells think that they're young again. And we don't know how many times we can reset the clock, but it'd be interesting if we could do it five, 10, 100 times. David, um, I'm, I'm running out of time. When can you move into this technology? <laughs> <laughs> well, we're, we're developing it for eye diseases first. And that'll hopefully be in a couple of years. We'll know if that works. But, you know, you, you can say you heard it here first. The, the world is about to explode with excitement around this area. And scientists are starting to really pay attention to this. So I, it won't just be myself and a couple of my friends doing this. It's going to be a global rush to, to find medicines that can be used to treat diseases, not just the eye, but hopefully every organ. That's insane. Well, if you need a sponsor for your research, I can 100% tell you that Nick is um, sitting there <laughs> credit card ready because honestly, he's one of your biggest fans and I have to thank him because he got me onto your research and, you know, it's it's actually incredible what you've achieved so far and it sounds like you're on track to be doing this for many, many, many years to come. <laughs> So a uh, big congratulations. Thank you so much for your time, David, and um, all the best with your research. Well, thank you. Uh, I appreciate all the kind words and, and keep doing what you're doing, um, bringing science and business to the world directly, which is, it's really a great, great time for a podcast like yours. Oh, thank you. And thank actually, you. I did hear you say that you're on um, Dax Shepard's podcast and you were saying that you actually prefer now to do podcast interviews rather than go to the media because as we all know, the media can uh, twist things really, <laughs> really easily. So thank you so much for making the time to come on yeah, out. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.